times as high as were used in that study. So the, the, um, the threat becomes much, much larger. Um, and then there's one other factor about uh, sea level rise that should be kept in mind. The three panels on this graph are respectively three different, uh, uh, the top panel is uh, six different ways of reducing emissions during the 21st century, uh, essentially shutting them down at six different points during the century and watching the CO2 levels in the atmosphere deteriorate going out to three, the year 3000, which is at the right-hand part of that graph. The second one is what temperature does in response to that decrease in CO2. You notice temperature decreases only slowly over the course of the millennium, and really there's a large effective irreversibility in the warming. And the third is just one component of sea level rise, the thermal expansion component, and that in fact counterintuitively continues to rise throughout the century, uh, throughout the millennium, even though the concentrations of CO2 are coming down slowly and the temperature is very slowly coming down, and that rise happens because because it takes a long time from the heat of the surface to penetrate to the lower levels of the ocean, so they haven't even started to expand yet, and they won't for some period of time. And that lag is one of the most uh, um, unusual and uh, planning-resistant parts of this problem. Not only is the whole thing uncertain, but we're stuck with, to, uh, to a large extent with what we build into the system. It makes it a very difficult problem to manage. So let me conclude by drawing this out, the following out of the talk. Number one, uh, sea level rise could well be large and fast uh, and is expected to be large and fast compared to what humans are used to experiencing over the past several hundred and several thousand years. Even a rapid emissions reduction during the century would leave a substantial amount of residual risk. That's what this slide shows. And so we're gonna have sea level rise to deal with in the future at a fairly substantial rate no matter what we do. And the uncertainties are very large and are unlikely to shrink soon simply because this is a problem which has proven very, very resistant to quantitative analysis. And being myself involved to some extent with the modeling, I can tell you progress will come, but it'll come very, very slowly. So our ability to project what those ice sheets are gonna do and what their local effects are gonna be is not gonna be vastly different, I don't think, five or 10 years from now. We shouldn't wait for scientific knowledge to get us out of this problem. It's not gonna narrow the uncertainties quickly. So to be effective in the face of these challenges, we're gonna need a lot of learning from each other. We're gonna need new approaches. I'm not convinced that the existing approaches, the hard approaches or engineering approaches, and the soft approaches like wetland re restoration or even migration, um, that, that the mixture which is served us in the past to maintain the deltas and the condition they're in and the civilizations on them. I don't think it works very well if we're in a world where the uncertainty is not only this large, but where um, the rate of sea level rise could be or, uh, you know, more than an order of magnitude more than what we had to deal with in the past. And as far as this conference is concerned, we need to remember each delta has unique vulnerabilities but each delta has unique capabilities, unique experience, and unique robustness. They've managed to survive, um, as have the people on them. But, delta, and, but despite those distinctions, delta ha, deltas have much in common, so the sharing of knowledge is going to be critical, particularly in the face of the huge and daunting uncertainties. Thank you very much. If I can thank Michael, I think we'll just press straight on. I think the, the subtext of that last presentation was be worried, be very, very worried. Um, we're now going to have uh, Professor Martin Parry, um, who's a colleague of mine on the, the UK um, Adaptation Committee. He um, is a visiting professor at Imperial College at the University of London. He was co-chair of Working Group 2 of the IPCC uh, during its uh, 2007 assessment and, and, and was a coordinating lead author in the first, second and third assessment. So I think, I think you could say he's been around the block a bit. Um, he is going to speak uh, from an IPCC perspective, particularly on the impacts uh, of climate change on estuaries other than sea level rise and also on the policy responses. Uh, 
thank you very much. It's a privilege to speak uh, to such a distinguished uh, and expert audience uh, on this. But my job as, in essentially, um, one of non-expertise, but of a generalist, is to uh, put what, uh, so eloquently, Michael Oppenheimer has said in a, in a more general context of the many um, non-climate change stresses occurring on deltas um, and the many other climate change stresses. Because I want to conclude that, as many of you will know, um, deltas are essentially a site that are, an, that are a nexus of compounding, frequently compounding rather than buffering, but certainly multiple stresses. And one question is whether we treat the management of those stresses in isolation or in combination or how. So let me just illustrate by way of introduction what I mean here. Uh, that as Michael mentioned, one has issues such as ongoing subsidence of tectonics, of sedimentation, but let me add to that the load of upstream changes, even in a non-climate change context, climate variability, cyclones, tropical storms in general, as well as sea level rise, and then with other aspects of global climate change added on to that, um, such as uh, changes in uh, seasonality of snowmelt, seasonality of runoff, the effects of land use, on top of the ongoing changes of land use in the watersheds, increasing damming, reduced sediment flux, uh, and so on, and the possibility of increased intensification of uh, tropical cyclones. And that's what led, in this particular context, the IPCC to pick up the table that, um, by Ericsson, which Michael Oppenheimer showed, to try to put uh, numbers and figures on this sort of cartoon, which illustrates that whole array of potential multiple stresses on this focal point, this nexus, and I won't read that out for you. And one figure that has essentially become, I think, iconic, at least to those aficionados of this area from the IPCC is uh, this, which is essentially a map, as I say, of the Ericsson table, the numbers of which Oppenheimer showed, but added to uh, by IPCC authors, the exposed numbers of people in deltas to the sea level rise and climate change uh, that were considered as within the IPCC scenarios, mapped here in terms of numbers at risk and the, the sites scaled to, to size accordingly. But more than that, what the IPCC did was to single out mega deltas in particular as one of the four regions that it could conclude and could agree by uh, consensus were the most exposed locations in the world. And in the summary of the synthesis report, that is the highest level that the IPCC makes statements, it three years ago made this statement that Asian and African mega deltas uh, joined company with sites like small islands of the Arctic as being most vulnerable to climate change. But more importantly, or equally importantly in this sli slide, I want to point out to you what I've highlighted in yellow at the bottom there. The IPCC concluded that in all areas, even the most wealthy, there are those sections of society, particularly the poor, young children, the elderly, and I would add to that those marginalized economically and politically that are, politically, that are especially sensitive to the multiple stresses of, of climate change. And all of those, of, of course, are found, indeed I'll argue par, par excellence, are found in the burgeoning mega deltas of, of Asia and the Nile. Consider also that some of the most vulnerable sectors that are listed there by the IPCC are just those sectors that deltas find themselves in, whether it's like the Nile Delta confronting an issue of water in, dry, in the dry tropics or those other deltas in um, southern and eastern Asia, which are indeed in low latitudes, which are in increasingly having been breadbasket areas uh, in agricultural terms for their region, are now with mega cities increasingly developing on them, very large populations becoming de 